I am Arno from Thinkcell. We have the booth outside. And uh, I'm going to talk about it from iterators to ranges. To get to know my audience a little bit, uh, let's start with a few questions. So, who knows Boost Range, the library? Okay, quite a few of you. Um, and who knows Eric Niebler's library? Okay, about as many. Um, and who already uses ranges when you are programming on an everyday basis? Okay, cool. Um, let's see, what are you using? So, uh, who is using Eric's library? Who is using Boost Range? Okay, Boost Range seems to have the edge there. Interesting, okay. Um, well, first of all, why should we use ranges? There were about 10% of you or so who are using ranges. I think everyone should use them because it really makes life a whole lot easier. So, how are we doing it in the era before ranges? You would write something like this. You have a std vector, and uh, you want to remove the duplicate elements. How do you do it? Well, you first sort the vector. std sort vec begin vec end. So, they we already have vec twice in there. And then you run vec erase. Vec erase of std unique, Vec begin, vec end, vec end. Hmm. I think we mentioned vec five times. That's far too many. And really, uh, what we should have is that pairs of iterators, they really belong together, right? We are talking about one entity here. So we want to put them together into a range. Um, but before we talk about this a little bit further, there is a bug in the code up there. And uh, I want you to tell me what it is. So we got sort, vec begin, vec end, and then erase, unique, begin, end, end. There is a subtle bug in that code. It almost works. Okay, I'm missing maybe some parentheses. That's not the bug I was talking about. <laughs> what is std sort using to sort a range? The std less, the less operator, okay? What is unique using to throw away elements? The equal operator, and there is the bug. If someone implements these things inconsistently, which, yes, you should not do, but imagine we do this in a library, and you don't want to make life unnecessarily difficult, you should really use for throwing away elements for the std unique you should really not your less operator. Really, this operation of throwing away duplicate elements should run on a single predicate. And this is something actually you can do when you're using ranges. Uh, we not only have the rangeify unique in place sort idiom in our library, we also have a sort unique in place that basically does the sorting and then throws the away the elements in one go. And it actually makes sure that you are using a consistent predicate. So these kind of things you can also get when you use range libraries. More consistent and arguably corrector code. Why do I think I know something about ranges? Um, so we started with boost range, using boost range in our code, but this evolved very much into our own range library um, that is public, and I will show you the, uh, the GitHub at the end. And we have about one million lines of production code that uses that library. And we have one big luxury. We have the library and we have the code. And we actually have one guy who does nothing else all day but refactoring code. So if we think something is wrong about our range library, we can change it at any time and change the one million lines production code along with it. So we learned a lot. By evolving that library, we learned how a range library should look like, which things produce mistakes, which things are idiomatic, which things are intuitive to use. And uh, some of that I want to tell you now in the code. What do we have right now for in terms of ranges? Well, turns out not much. Uh, in the standard, we have, that was in C++11, not much has changed in C++17. Um, we have a, the range-based for loop and that essentially works on anything that has a begin and an end. Uh, we also have universal access to begin and end, this std begin and std end, 
which unfortunately doesn't quite work because they forgot to add the ADL lookup. So if you want to add a begin and end to an existing type, you have kind of a problem because you would have to basically, when you, when you write it into the same namespace as that type, it won't be found by std begin, std end. So really, um, you have to write using std begin and then begin. That's kind of the idiomatic way to use std begin, std end, because they don't do it internally. And that's all. That's all we have. Um, there's going to be more coming up. And the future of ranges is really, in the, as far as the standard is concerned, is by and large Eric Niebler's pet project. Um, he is driving that, um, and, and I'm thankful for it. So um, the, the first thing that is going into a, the standard is going to be the technical specification ranges. Um, it essentially, for, for, for you, for the, for the programmer, adds, by and large, the algorithms we already have in the standard library, which currently take iterator pairs as range versions. So you then can invoke it with anything that exposes begin and end. Um, that's not a whole lot. The, the real thing that Eric would like to standardize is in his library, the range v3 library. It contains quite a bit more. And uh, before we go into details, let's clarify what ranges are. Ranges are anything that has, for the purpose of the standard right now, anything that is a begin and an end. That, of course, can be your plain vanilla containers vectors, strings, lists, um, they, these containers, they, they are usually owning their elements. So when you throw away the containers, the elements get destroyed. They have deep copy semantics. So when you copy the container, the elements get copied. And they have deep constness. So if you have a const version of the container, then you, all your elements are const. You can't modify the elements. You think, well, that's quite natural, right? I mean, that's how it should be. Well, not quite. There are views. And views are quite the opposite. It's like, well, what, what does that mean? What's quite the opposite mean? Um, well, think iterator pairs. Iterator pairs, there, they don't own their elements. They, when you copy the iterators, they, the elements stay untouched. Uh, and when the iterator itself is const, that does not influence whether you can access the elements const or not. And this is really um, these same properties, these other ranges have, which are called views in the standard. And a simple implementation of such a view is here the, the iterator range. Um, you basically have a pair of iterators encapsulated into one object. Easy enough. Well, if that would be the end of the story, that would be a little bit sad. Um, and that wouldn't be quite enough to justify a, uh, an important change in the standard. But there is more. And um, to motivate that, let's look at this problem. Let's say you want to five, have a vector again, and you want to find of ints, and you want to find an element, say, four in that vector. Um, you would write something like find vector four. OK, clear enough. Um, let's say you want to do the same thing in a, again, you want to find a four in a vector. But that vector doesn't contain ints directly. It contains the ints embedded in some larger structure. And really what you want to do is you want to do a projection um, of the structure onto the int that is contained in the structure and then look for the four in that projection. Now, the way to write that, if you have nothing else, would be with a find if and then aid equals four, as you see in the bottom at, at the bottom. Um, but it's kind of ugly, because arguably, these two things are very similar in semantics. You're looking for a four in a list of ints. Just the nature of this list of ints is different. But when you look at the syntax that we use, it's very different. There's nothing to do uh, with one another. And uh, rangers are out to change that. Enter the transform adapter. And the transform adapter is probably the one of the two most important range kind of innovations you will use. Um, what it does is you, you can transform a, a, a range, a given range, with a given function. Down here, you are taking, doing a TC transform of the vector, and you're plugging in a std memfin 
that extracts the ID from the elements of the vector. The important thing here is when you are invoking transform, when you're running the transform call, nothing happens. The vector gets wrapped into an object, but nothing gets executed. The, the structs, the elements stay as they are. And only when you then iterate over that transform, that transformed range, you will actually, with every dereferencing of an iterator, you will actually invoke your, your function, your, your, your mapping function, and do the actual transformation to the end. And when you do that here for our problem, then suddenly things look quite more similar. So you have range find on top, and you have the range find uh, at the bottom just as well. So, but in this case, you're finding on, you're doing your find on the transformed version of the vector. So we have separated our algorithm, the find, from the, the thing we are finding in, from the projection. How does this transform adapter uh, oh, one, one more little subtlety down here. Um, in both cases, I just naively assigned the iterator that we found to, to it, right? Now, what does it point to? Here's the same code again. Well, it, of course, points to int because our find runs over a list of ints, so the iterator that it passes out is an iterator to int. Well, very frequently, that's probably not what you want. You kind of want to go back to your, to your source of your transform. And uh, so you want to point, the it should point to a instead of int. So um, in this case, the library offers something like a dot base, where you can go back from the iterator of the transformed range to the iterator of the base range, in this case, the vector. So the it down below would actually point to A's. Here's how a transform adapter is implemented. Um, if, you, if you do it naively, um, you, you basically, your, your struct um, may contain just two iterators um, that are transforming while they are being dereferenced. And for them to do that, the iterators need to contain a functor, and of course, they need to contain a copy of the iterator. And then, as you can see here, the dereference simply applies the functor to the dereferenced iterator, the base iterator, and passes the result out. And the base just gives you the, the, in the encapsulated iterator. Okay, that was number one. That was the transform. Uh, here's number two, the filter. These are really the two big ones. Um, if, you, if you count the number of occurrences in the code base, I think they, were, they, they dominated about 80% of the use cases or so. So let's say this time we want, um, again, the vector. It contains, uh, again, our, uh, our struct A. But we want to restrict it to the A's where the ID is for. So we want to filter the vector for all the things where the ID is for. And this is how you write it. So again, the TC filter just produces an object that exposes that range that you can iterate over. Nothing is happening yet. And only when you actually need elements, then this thing is running or is doing actually doing some filtering, which is good if you, for example, only need the first element, right? Why would you filter the whole range if you only need the first element of it? And this, this is doing exactly that, so it's, uh, it's, it's nice. Now here's your filter adapter implementation. So if you do this uh, in the kind of naive way, um, you start with the filter range, which again contains iterators. And for the iterator to, it do, to, its, to do its job, it again needs a few things. One is the function that you want to do the filtering with, and the other one is the, the, the iterator. Well. There's a little caveat here. You also need the end iterator. So you need to store two iterators inside your iterator. Why? Well, when you're starting to filter and you're throwing away things, then at some point you may reach end. So everything, say, before end got filtered, and now you're standing at end. You need to know when to stop. Otherwise, you're going to inadvertently dereference the end iterator, still looking for your element. So you need to know where to stop. And thus, you need the end iterator. Hmm. Okay. Um, that's kind of cool. Well, 
How does the iterator look like? Of a filter, of a filter, of a filter. Like this. So when you are, it's quite natural to stack these things. You, you, get a, you get a range from somewhere. You don't really know where it comes from in your generic algorithm. And uh, so then you apply another algorithm to it, a filter, say, and suddenly you get double the size of your original iterator. Well, you do this five times, and you're moving like 200 bytes large iterators through your program. That can't really be very efficient. Hmm. And for everyone who is doing using boost range, they do that. Um, we pointed that out to the standard, uh, to, to Eric Niebler actually, and um, they did something in the standard that helps out a little bit. They said, okay, we are going to require that as, as long as you are using an iterator of a range, that range must stay alive. You must keep that range around. Your range must not go out of scope, and you are still using the iterators, kind of like it, how it is with containers. And this is actually in the standard. Um, and that helps a lot, because what you can do is you can store all the stuff that is the same over all the iterators, the functor and the end, you can store that inside your, your range object. So you move that into the range object, and your iterators are just containing the base iterator and then a pointer to their range object. And, and whenever they need the end iterator or the functor, they go to the range object and, and get it from there. Consequence, iterators cannot outlive the range. And this is now what you get. Well, it's still not insanely great. So your outer iterator contains a pointer to its range object. But then, of course, the base iterator again contains a pointer to the base object and, and so on. So you still get this linear growth in the size of iterators. And that's range v3 slash standard state of the art. That's all they have. Well, we didn't like it. So what can we do better? Um, let's introduce a a different concept, uh, which is a little bit like an iterator. Um, I call it an index. Some call it, I've heard position as, um, as a name for it. Um, it. It has been around. And the idea is really, whenever you are doing an operation on that pseudo iterator, you're not going to do it directly on the iterator. You are going to do it on the iterator in combination with its range object. So when you're incrementing, it's may be implemented as a function on the range, please increment that index. Please decrement that index. Please dereference that index. And you always have to supply both of these things, the range and the index. And it's like, well, that, that's kind of a departure from, from existing best practice, right? We're used to iterators, so mm, that's not really great. Uh, so how does that help, right? Why do we do so complicated? Well, first of all, let's deal with the legacy part, with we want iterators instead of these, these indices and where we have two objects to deal with. Um, compatibility is relatively easy to achieve. So first of all, any iterator can be used as an index. So if you want to wrap the vector into something that supports that, that, uh, that um, index concept, that's easily done because any iterator that can do these things by themselves will serve as an index just fine. You just have to, can ignore the range object information and just iterate, uh, operate directly on your index slash iterator. So that's OK. Now, the other way around, um, if, you want, if you have an index and you want an iterator, that's also pretty easy, because essentially any index you have, you can always wrap together generically into an object that is holding a pointer to the base range and encapsulates, aggregates the index. And th that you can do for any index that is, that is out there. Um, in fact, that's what's happening in our code. Um, our, our user code is still written with, with iterators, just like before, um, even if underneath we use something else. And um, now the question is, well, OK, now we, we ha can do the introduce these indices without too much compatibility problems with past code. Um, but how do they help? 
Well, they do help greatly. Um, you can do something like this if you have an index-based filter range. You, inside your filter range, you again store your functor, and you store not the end iterator, but a reference to the base range, to, your, to the range that you filtered. Now, your increment index that takes an index and increments it can be implemented in terms of the increment index of the base range. And as you can see, the index of that filter range is then exactly the same type as the index of the base range. So you don't add any extra memory requirements to these, these adapted iterators, to the, these the adapted ranges. Whenever you are iterating over them, the iterator will then be the wrapped index, and that will basically contain two machine words, one being the index, kind of like a pointer, and the other one being the pointer to the base range. So you're getting by with two words, regardless of the stacking depth. That's kind of cool. Now, here's that again. Um, here's another difference to what, from what we are doing versus the range v3, which is likely to go into the standard. Um, the standard makes a very strong distinction between creating between creating between views and containers so containers are containing their elements and views are just referencing elements they have that kind of the iterator semantics sounds like a good idea um, the problem that arises is the following say you do this uh, looks all good so you filter your vetic vector with a predicate and the filter object will just may uh, aggregate a reference to the vector. So as long as your vec stays alive, everything is honky-dory, and you can do it just like I wrote here. Now, let's change that a little bit. Let's say the vector was created in place. And when you're programming with ranges, you actually do this very often. Your urge to inline is quite big. It's quite, you don't need to name that stuff anymore. You just say, okay, I'm just going to generate a vector, and then I'm going to filter it and transform it, and la 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 la. And it's all fine, except that if you're now doing what we did before, we store a reference to that vector that we passed to the filter, well, that reference is going to go out of scope. It's, it's going to dangle because the create vector is going, the, the vector that's being created in create vector is going to go out of scope. Hmm. So what do we do? Well, range v3 says just don't compile. Disallow that because it's dangerous. The thing is, people will try to make things compile. And the alternative that the range v3 library offers is this. There's not a view filter, but it's an action filter. How is that different? Well, it works with our values, but it's also eager. It will take the vector and do the filtering right then and there. It will filter the vector and the auto range that we actually assigned will actually be the filtered vector. So it is very tempting to replace this with that, but you lose potentially a lot of performance. If you only need the first value of that vector, you just filter it all, and then you just take the first element, and that's it, and you throw the whole thing away. Quite inefficient. And I think that's dangerous. That proved in our code base that that was an, an untenable situation. It's not lazy anymore. So what do we do at ThinkCell when you run into this R-value problem? If the adapter input is an L-value container, so if it's, if it's a reference, then the filter will create a view. It will just reference that L-value uh, because presumably it will stay in scope this kind of transparent that you're holding a reference there. And then the view is a reference. Now, um, if the adapter input is an R value, if it has just been created prior to calling the filter, then the filter will automatically detect that, will say, okay, this is an R value reference, and will generate a different type that aggregates that R value, that copies the R value um, into the 
into that, that object itself. And it will actually be a container. So you will have a container that has deep copy semantics, it has deep const, and it's owning its elements, but it's still lazy. And, and that's kind of, I think that's kind of important. There is the laziness aspect of ranges, and then there is the range aspect of ranges. The <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, there's the laziness aspect, and there's the container aspect. And these two are, by and large, orthogonal. You can have one, but you don't have the other. And I think that's something that's an important feature to have. <coughs> okay, let's go, uh, let's go on. Now, so far, um, we, we played around already with that find. And if you have ranges, it's kind of tempting to say, okay, isn't there, it's, it still returns an iterator. It's, uh, we, we were living in a range world. And maybe it's sometimes more useful to actually return a range. So let's look at this. Um, what this pack actually is doing, we introduced another template parameter into the pack, into the find, which controls how the, what the find is returning. And really the find has two situations. One is, I found something, great, what do I return? And the other one is, fi find didn't find anything, what am I returning? And by default, in the first case, you return an iterator. In the second case, you return end. It's not really clear to me why you are returning end. It's, it's by and large an arbitrary choice. <coughs> and what you want, may want to do instead is things like, th things like that. I don't know if how often you've written a find with an assertion afterwards, oh, I don't want this to be end, because I know that that element should be contained in the vector or in the thing that I'm, that I'm finding it. And you don't have to write that assert anymore. What you can do actually instead is you can just say, hey, don't say return iterator or end, but I just want return iterator. I don't think this or end case is a valid case. This is an assertion, this is an invalid state in my program. And now you basically can annotate your find with that expectation and it annotated with what you actually want. You can go one step further. Well, if we can best specify what we are returning, um, then we may as well do things like that. Say re we return the head. We return everything from the beginning to what we found. And you may as well have return head or an empty range, or return head if you didn't find anything, return empty. Or if you didn't find anything, you return everything. So you can specify what kind of return you want from your find. Now, let's go away a little bit, or le let's extend a little bit the definition of what a range is. So far, it's, it's anything that has a begin and an end that you can get iterators from and iterate. But there are other situations where you have something that is like a range, where you are enumerating values, but you don't really naturally have an iterator. Here is, I have as an example, traverse widgets. And known as a visitor pattern, so you pass a functor, and that functor now gets called with all the elements. Easy enough. <coughs> Let me drink something. Okay, hope that gets better now. So, um, right, so y this is, you, you're passing a function, and that function gets passed all the elements that you want to enumerate, one by one. And uh, the thing is, it would be kind of hard to write an iterator for that, because it's recursive. So you're having a window, and you're traversing its widgets, and the widgets may contain sub-widgets, and um, it's, it's a bit of a like a range, but it doesn't have any iterators. But still, maybe you want to use it like a range. Let's see how this works. Um, you may want to write something like this. Did the mouse had any widgets? Well, that's a like, like a natural any off, right? You go through all your elements, and then you say, okay, um, is, is, does anyone, 
of these widgets got a mouse hit. Now, the natural way to do this um, is to change the way we iterate. Usually what we do when we iterate with iterators is we have the consumer at the bottom of the stack and the producer at the top of the stack. So the consumer calls star it and it calls into the iterator to generate a value and that then returns and you have your value. Then you do some processing on it and when you need the next value, you again call into your iterator and it returns. So consumers at the bottom, producers at the, at the top. This has consequences. Uh, consumers at the bottom of the stack. So it has actually a contiguous code path for the whole range. So you can write your code anywhere and whenever you need a value, you say, hey, I need a value and you get a value and then you need the next value, you get another value. So it's very easy to write that in, as a continuous control flow. Um, you get better performance because in an iterator, you kind of have to restore your state. You need to know where you are to get the next value. If you are in a continuous control flow, the state is encoded essentially in your instruction pointer of, of your iteration. And you also have no limit for stack memory. You can basically remember as much as you want on the stack while you're iterating because your stack actually stays around during your iteration. When th for the producer who's at the top of the stack, so even you're writing an iterator essentially, um, it's different. Your contiguous code path is only for the single item. When you're going to the next item, you had a return and then you get called again. <coughs> it's harder to write these things. Imagine you have to traverse a tree. It's pretty trivial as a contiguous code path. You just call, make recursive calls. Well, if you had to write an iterator for that, that would be quite a bit harder. Um, and you can only remember so much in your iteration, inside your iterator. You have a fixed amount of me memory, or you have to act actually go and allocate the memory on the stack, which is somewhat inefficient. So that's, that's an, a problem you don't have when you sit at the bottom of the stack. So what we basically did, and, and actually this thing is named external iteration. I didn't, that's, that's the computer science uh, name for that kind of iteration, as opposed to the internal iteration. What do we do during internal iteration? Well, we turn this whole thing around. We put the producer at the bottom of the stack, and it calls into the consumer whenever it has a new value. Now, all the advantages and disadvantages are just the other way around. No surprise. Um, and again, nothing magic. But it turns out, um, before I, I, I go to the consequences, of course, I, I said that the, to be at the bottom of the stack is great. So all these advantages. And top of the stack kind of sucks because you have a lot of disadvantages. Wouldn't it be nice if you could both, the consumer and the producer, could be at the bottom of the stack? Well, they can be with coroutines. Um, coroutines are kind of would, would work like this. You, you are, uh, the, the traverse widgets, whenever it's, it's enumerating a widget um, with the yield command, it would kind of pass the, the, the next element over to this other coroutine or thread. And it just continues. So it's kind of a ping pong game. Like both these, these, the producer and the consumer both run along the same thread uh, or run their thread of execution. And ever, whenever one has a value, it just passes over to the other one. And when there's the next one wants the same next value, it tells you, hey, give me the other one. And it continues to the next point where it actually has a value. So it kind of runs. And they just continue their execution to generate the next value. Okay, uh, that's great. But it's hard to do. Um, so either you need two complete stacks, which is kind of like two complete threads, fibers really. Um, they are fibers as kind of threads, but you, you don't get the automatic execution. It's a cooperative threads. Um, but usually they have to have their own stack, so you need virtual memory for a stack. So it, it is a pretty heavyweight thing, which if you only have to do a a, and we are talking small loops here that we want to optimize. And to do that with such a heavyweight thing is not going to be very performant. There is an alternative, uh, stackless coroutines. They have been uh, proposed in 
N4402, uh, and there they kind of simplified the problem for of, of generating these things um, by by restricting the yielding to the topmost function. And there, the this is much simpler because the amount of stack you need can be calculated in advance. Essentially, the compiler knows how much stack a single function will take up and can allocate that function somewhere as part of your, your, your iterator, if you will. And um, that, will actually, uh, that will actually make it possible to run generators as, uh, without actually generating or having two stacks. Again, even stack restoroutines are a little bit expensive. Uh, you have dynamic jumps to the resume point. Uh, you have to save some registers when, you, when you're yielding. Um, and I don't think anyone can do aggressive inlining yet for these things. Um, the, and the, the big disadvantage is also you, you, you don't gain quite as much as with the stack full coroutines because you really have to be you, these recursive patterns with, with the yielding uh, for, for the widgets that I showed relied on the fact, and that's frequently the case, that you have a recursive callback. And recursion, of course, is out of the game if you can only yield in the topmost function. And it turns out, uh, going through our code base, that internal iteration actually is often good enough. Um, you, you can't run a find because as, at least as long as you're returning iterators, you can run a find if you only need the value. Then you could just return the value. Um, you can't do the binary search, again, same reason, but you can do it for each. Actually, the for each is kind of the primary thing where you really turn the external iteration into an internal iteration. You say, here's my body that you w I want you to call for every one of my elements. Well, this is exactly what internal iteration is doing. So the for each is a very natural, and it's, it's very frequent. I mean, most of these things are, are for loops, are, are, are for eaches um, that we are using ranges for. Uh, you can do accumulate, you can do all of, any of, none of. So many of the algorithms that we are running can, are actually happy with internal iteration. So it is, seems silly not to support it because it is performance-wise and has advantages. Um, let's look at adapters that I showed you previously where adapt the ranges. Uh, you, can you can do them with, with internal iteration. Um, you can do the filter, you can do the transform. So how does a filter as internal iteration looks like? Well, you get called from your, 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 your range with a new element. Look at the new element, you say, is it good? If it's good, you pass it on to, the pr to your consumer. If it's bad, you just drop it and say, well, no, next one. Um, and actually, the filter becomes more efficient if you do it that way. Because usually, when you are running a filter, while you are iterating, you need to dereference twice. First, you are doing your plus plus, and when you're doing your, your, your increment, you need to check, does this pass my filter or not? And then you say, okay, it passes my filter, I stop with my plus plus, I'm done now. And then the caller, or the, you, your caller, is gonna come back and say, okay, now give me the element. But that element is an element you already looked at. That's not so bad if you're iterating over a vector, but if you have a, if you're running on top of a transform, that is actually producing the value, then that may actually be expensive. Um, so here's an any-off implementation with internal iteration. You get a range, and then you enumerate the values in that range. You get the bools in the, in the Boolean context out of that, out of that range, and you say uh, result is result or B, and the return will result. Is that okay? Well, we're not quite there yet because the, the normal any off is lazy. It stops as soon as you found something. So you want to replicate that if you do internal iteration. So my first idea how to do this was, oh, okay, when we want to stop, let's throw an exception. That's a very bad idea uh, because that's way too slow. Um, the second idea was, well, okay, let's just introduce an enum, special enum that says, do we want to break or do you want to continue? And then the uh, any of looks like this. You just say, okay, I'm accumulating my B result as before, and if I found one that is true, then I say, hey, break. And you expect your underlying range to respect that. So while he's iterating, you, 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 and you are returning break, 
then he has to say, okay, that's fine, then, then we're stopping. Um, now, the generator range, potentially, we, we just said here, we want the range to actually um, heed our hint that we want to break. Um, but if we don't break, if we, if we don't have a function that ever breaks, um, you can actually elide the break check. So the range can actually, at compile time, decide, does the function, the functor I'm calling, does it actually return that enum, break or continue? If you could turn something else, you can just elide the check. You just don't check. Um, and, and again, so you're not losing performance. This is like the zero overhead principle that uh, Jim Lake has talked about. Now, does this do things in a better way as before? Here's another example. Uh, concatenation. Say you want to concatenate two ranges and then do a for each over them. If you do a concatenate of two ranges with iterators, actually it's not so simple because essentially your iterator that's inside the concatenated range needs to know, am I still inside my first range or am I already in the second range? And the increment of the iterator is different in either case. So whenever you're having an increment index, then you kind of have a switch on that variant of, of indices. Here's the variant, std variant of index one, index two, so you store either one and you need to know which one I stored at any given time. And then when I'm actually doing the increment, I need to say, okay, am I, doing the am I now having the first one or the second one? And if you're having the first one, you increment the first one, do the check, and then potentially have to jump over to your second, uh, second range. Now, dereferencing again, you also need to, to switch. You also need to say, okay, either I'm in my first uh, range or in my second range. And you need to do this each time you are dereferencing. So there's a lot of branches, one for the increment index, one for the dereference index. It's kind of bad. You would like to have zero overhead principle. You would like, like, iterate, like the basically, ideally, the for each over a concatenated range should be just as efficient as the for each of the first range and then for each for the second range. Should be no difference really. And you can actually do it with the generator ranges. So here it's simple, right? So the operator parentheses is, is doing the enumeration and it just enumerates first the values of the first range and then the second value, uh, the second, the, the, the values of the second range. And in both cases it's actually using the same functor as a sync. So it's, you get all the performance that you would want. So the conclusion here is even for iterator-based, for things you, you actually have an iterator implementation for, like a concat, at ThinkCell, we actually have, in parallel, a generator range implementation. And then we let the algorithm choose which one it wants to use. So the for each will always use the generator implementation because it's more efficient, potentially, and it doesn't need the extra functionality of iterators. All right, so I'm coming to the end. Um, here is the URL of our range library. You can take a look. Uh, it's, it's online. You can use it. And um, before I conclude, I want to say I hate the range-based for loop. This thing is a disaster. Why? Because people write this. If all I have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If all I have is a for loop, I write for loops but they could write this. Thank you very much. Hi there, thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about, um, do you support any um, parallelism in your ranges or do you, um, are you thinking about doing so in the future? Uh, we don't, well, um, we actually, no, we don't right now. We do have a parallel, well, we do parallel for each. I think we have two parallel for each or so in the program, which, um, the, I mean, the library is fairly extensible. It works together with anything else you have. So, I mean, if you want to plug, uh, say, a transform range into a parallel iterating thing, uh, it'll just work. I mean, it'll just iterate in parallel, put, split it apart into blocks, and then run the transform uh, in parallel. So it all plugs and plays, really. Um, the, the, the thing with parallelism is, I, I think, is not so much a problem of concepts 
at least as far as they are defined right now, but more have you, do you have a good implementation on the platform? And that, that's currently, I mean, we are still battling with it, so, so the, uh, the, the Microsoft implementation isn't great, and I think Clang doesn't have any implementation right now at all. Um, so that, that's, I think, a battle that still needs to be fought. Thank you for a great talk. Uh, if I may switch to a more general topic, do you have something like ranges or iterators for two-dimensional containers like tables, matrices, spreadsheets? Uh, the short answer is no. So that's all I can say. <laughs> Hi, I had a question about the base, dot .base syntax that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, I was curious to know if you use that in production code and if you use it when you have several adapters piling up like transform, filter and transform, do you use base, base, base? Do you find that convenient? Uh, yes, you do. And, and arguably that's w what you want. Base is an interesting topic in general. Um, it, so, so if I digress a little bit, um, there is no real one base. Um, it turns out if you're using a reverse iterator, um, that there, I didn't mention the reverse adapter, which turns out the direction or, of, of your iteration, um, or even with things like, with things like filter, um, you don't always have unique bases. So imagine you have a filter. The filter does not contain some of the elements that are that are actually in your, um, that are in your original sequence. I mean, that's why you did the filter. Now, if you call base, you get the base iterator, but the iterators sometimes have the meaning of a boundary. So when you do a lower bound, for example, on, on, that, uh, on that filtered range, then you get a boundary somewhere inside the filter, and you can't really base it. So th there is a weakness of iterators um, that they don't express whether you mean boundaries or elements inside your range. Now, back to your question. Um, do you want to do this individually um, for, for every kind of shell that you, you, that you, that you uh, of the onion that you put around your ranges? Uh, yes, you do. Because very frequently, you basically don't know what you're getting. You, are only, you, you the programmer, knows locally how many onion shells you put around. So a very typical example that we have is um, this kind of binary, binary search or, or, or find where you transform and then you find and then you do the dot base. There, very clearly, you want to make sure that you are unpeeling exactly the number of, 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 of layers that you actually know you actually wrapped around it. But you don't know what your caller did. You don't know what your call, if your caller gave you something already that is a big onion, well, you want to keep that onion as it is and just wrap your shell around it, do your thing, and unwrap one shell. So that's, it seems like Clang of a bit clumsy, and you, there are pictures in the mind of dot base, dot base, dot base, dot base. In reality, that doesn't happen, because locally, you, you are only using one shell, maybe two, uh, but, but that would be it. The, these, this, this massive stacking really comes about through through code like like calls, recurrent like calls in, in where one range get passed to another function to another function, and every function actually contributes something to that range, and, and that's how you get that large stacking depth. Uh, we certainly have four or five, but they are not four or five happening locally. They are four or five happening throughout the whole call stack. Uh, thank you. I, I enjoyed your talk. I had two questions. Uh, first, you mentioned um, if you filter on an R value, you turn the result into a container. Uh, and I think on the same slide you said you do this lazily. Um, I had assumed that you would just move the container, you know, the R value, into your thing. But that would not be lazy. That would be a cheap operation, but it's not lazy per se. Is that, do you mean it's lazy it, That's what that? it, it's the, the filtering is lazy. The, the moving is not, the moving is, is a move, and you okay. assume that the, it's O of 1, hopefully, okay. and, um, and yeah, that's it. So it, I, there's, I think, no, that's the solution I have, is, is you move the R values into that object that is, that, that's, your, that's your filter, say, 
and uh, then only the actual filtering is O of 1, but it, it is, is actually generating elements. But it's still very different from doing it eagerly, to do the whole filter eagerly. I mean, that's surely O of N, uh, and, and that's unnecessary. All right, that's great. And then the other question is, is more general. <coughs> um, I think you've made some compelling uh, arguments here for why the TS is maybe not optimal. Right? Uh, what's being proposed and what is moving forward, probably in C++20 standard, is not having all of the nice properties that, you're pro that you guys developed. Um, how did it, I assume you talked to this committee and said, you know, there's some, you could do some things better. What was the reaction? Um, so, I, I didn't talk to the committee, I talked to Eric, and, and we, we, didn't, we didn't really want to fight the battle, maybe we should have, uh, but um, Eric likes his things as they are, and um, he, the, uh, the R value problem, he doesn't see really much of a pro as, as much of a problem. Um, the thing is that it, what we try to prevent is going th things going into the standard that would prevent future improvement. And I think so far, they, we've, we've achieved that. So one thing was the iterative validity um, restricted to the ranges. If you don't do that, I don't, I don't can think of any way how to get this thing to be efficient. Um, so, so that we actually managed, that we pointed out and said, okay, and they, and they actually changed it, they took it up. Um, there, are, there are other things right now which um, related to there's currently a requirement in the standard that begin and end, this is in ranges TS. It, it, the ranges TS is really just a very basic foundation. It doesn't contain much that is relevant to what I talked about. The, the implementations of the algorithms with the iterator pairs replaced by ranges, that's, that's motherhood and apple pie. Everyone wants that and that, that's undoubtedly fine. Um, there, are, there are details um, in the ranges TS which we actually brought up in the in the standard uh, uh, in the committee meeting uh, to little success, I must say. Um, they demand that begin is O of one, which in the normal filter Im implementation that I showed here, it is not because you have to find your first element, and that's potentially O of n. Um, they they didn't like it um, because there is a combination when you're, when you're stacking a reverse on top of a filter. The reverse needs to repeatedly check begin. And that would need to be basically every one of these calls, the begin would be O of N. There are several solutions to this problem. Um, so you could say either the, 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 um, either the filter has to cache the begin which, if you, so, so either the, the filter has to cache the begin or the reverse has to cache the begin. Um, but if you are forcing begin to, a, to be O of one, you're really pushing it into the filter. You're really saying the filter has to cache, which actually leads to, in the current uh, ranges V3 implementation, leads to a very, to the pretty strange situation um, that the, that because begin is actually, f uh, um, is, is actually cached on demand. So this thing is no longer threat safe. The filter, Eric's filter is no longer threat safe and the begin is mutable. It is non-const. So it can't be called on a const object. I, I found at this, I mean, I, I don't want to dispute the general design um, as at, at the, like, I don't want to judge it to be the end product but I think at this stage, it was, very, it was premature to say, hey, we're going to make uh, the, 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 put the requirement on begin and end to be O of 1. And, and also at this stage, it was just unnecessary because none of the requirements that is, or none of the functionality added by ranges TS actually relies on it. There's no, range, there's no reverse adapter. There's no adapter at all. There's no transform adapter. There's no filter adapter in range TS. So this was purely a, an additional requirement that in my eyes didn't serve any, any real purpose. We wrote a paper, brought it up to little avail. Um, there may be with indices, there may be a, 
a, um, a solution to this problem that, that avoids it all, where basically you can have O of 1 begin, you can have const begin and threat safety um, all at the same time in most cases. I haven't explored it yet, we have to try it out in our code base, but um, it, 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 may, it may work. And then it's not such a bad requirement, then we can lift it begin O of 1. I don't know, these are the details right now. With, and then the range is V3, I think hasn't really bis be, hasn't been discussed in, in, a, in great length, so there it's still kind of Eric's thing. Anything else? Maybe it for the uh, last uh, question because we don't have enough time, actually. So thank you very much for a great talk once again. Thank you.